Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Developing the Next Generation of Model-Based Systems Engineers, presented by Ray Hudson. My name is Donna Long and I will be your host during today's webinar. Ray Hudson has extensive industry experience as a practicing systems engineer and has for many years taught undergraduate aerospace engineering students critical engineering skills at California State Polytechnic University. Hudson's students regularly compete in AIAA design competitions. Before Ray gets started, I have a few housekeeping items. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions in as soon as you think of them through the question tab on the webinar control panel. Ray will answer as many questions as he can today, but if we do not get to your question, we will reach out to you after the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. If you experience connection problems during the live presentation, a recording will be made available within one business day. The recording will be published to Vitex Webinar Archive, located on our website. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Ray. Welcome. Thank you so much, Donna, and welcome to everyone. Uh, good day to you, wherever you are, might be around the world, wherever you may be dialing in. Uh, my name is Ray. Um, whenever you first work in a flight test program, they always give you a handle, and I was uh, lovingly given the handle Rain Man, so that's the way a lot of people refer to me. Um, a little more background on myself before I get started. Um, my depth area in engineering is guidance, navigation, and control systems. Um, primarily aircraft. I've worked on various civil and military aircraft over my career, but I've also worked on some launch vehicles, some missile systems, and some spacecraft controls. Um, so most of the examples that I will give you, and, and when I talk about, I'm very much an airplane knucklehead, so I will use airplane examples uh, because it's what I know best. So please forgive me <laughs> for that little. Uh, so let's get started and uh, talk give you a little bit of an introduction of what I'm going to talk to you about today. We're going to start out by talking about relational knowledge modeling and how, how it really is the, the foundation for higher levels of cognition and how important it is, uh, how important we feel it is to be able to teach undergrads this as part of their systems engineering experience. Uh, then I'm going to go into the 3D orthogonal architecture schema uh, that I particularly use for teaching and that I've used professionally for many years. Uh, we will talk about how it actually is a DODAF compliant and DODAF derived schema. And most of our examples that were, well, all of our examples actually that we'll be looking at uh, will be couched in this orthogonal architecture schema. The examples that I'll give you will focus on a quantified trade study process and how that flows from the metrics modeling class that I include in my schema. And we will also look at safety fault tree analysis, which also flows from the architecture schema. Uh, the metrics and the risk parts of our modeling schema are rich sources of requirements. And in systems engineering, we pay very deep attention to requirements and we search for them and make sure that they are correct. So. These are two particular areas that I try to stress when I teach my Aero 4510 model-based system architecture course. Finally, I'll wrap up by giving you some information on the teaching model that I use. Mostly, why do we offer this course? Um, I put it together back in the 2012 timeframe to augment our sophomore course. This is an elective, 4510 is a senior elective, but we have a mandatory course in the sophomore year uh, fundamentals of systems engineering. And then I will talk about uh, how I administer and implement the course. So with that, let's get moving on and talk about types of knowledge. We can um, look through the literature and we can find various different ways in which knowledge is broken down into um, opposing groups of two. For example, uh, explicit knowledge is that knowledge which can be recorded and communicated. Obviously, explicit knowledge is very important to us in systems engineering since communication is a key to helping people understand our ideas and concepts. But then there's the alternate, which is the tacit knowledge, which can only be experienced. 
uh, by the person who is seeking that knowledge. In similar form, uh, we can look at declarative knowledge versus procedural knowledge. Declarative being can stated as a proposition. Very, very important in the model-based systems engineering world. Uh, versus something that is procedural knowledge, which uh, can only really be applied to a procedure. Obviously, if you can state something as a proposition, you can write it down, including a procedure, and that would be declarative, but the actual implementation of the procedure um, is only applied, applied knowledge, if you will. And similarly, we can talk about a priori versus a posteriori knowledge, deductive versus inductive. Now, all of these forms of knowledge are important for any budding engineer. Uh, we need to be able to operate in both of these um, alternate means. So deductive knowledge is, again, very important for our modeling work. But inductive knowledge is something that comes from our considerations of our models. What are our models telling us? And where might our models have gaps that need to be filled in? So looking at those three different categories of knowledge, if you will, I want to introduce another one called relational knowledge, which most of us are familiar about with because uh, relational databases are sort of the foundation of our model-based systems engineering experience. And so here I cite a paper that talks about relational knowledge as being the foundation of higher cognition, a paper written back in 2010. And I give you the abstract here. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but this is kind of broaching the subject of relational knowledge. And it's going to help us investigate how we use relational knowledge to teach this class in model-based systems engineering. So very much so, this class is, is about knowledge modeling. It's, it's about um, giving the students a framework to weave all of the technical tools that they've been taught over a four-year undergraduate engineering degree into something that allows them to uh, expand on their ability to reason through relationships. So first things first, let's introduce three distinct levels of knowledge modeling as we know them and as we implement them. We call the highest level a class relationship model. And within that class and relationship modeling construct, we can create individual schemas or meta models that organize and structure the data that we're going to instantiate or implement within that modeling context. Some examples of them we should know if uh, those of us who are familiar with uh, Vitech products, Core and Genesis. We understand the concept of classes and relationships between the classes, very much object-oriented derived. And uh, I guess I should also point out that those of us who are old enough to remember when the DOORS tool came online, well, one thing I like to point out is that DOORS is also a class and relationship tool. Um, I've seen good and bad implementations in DOORS. Um, some of the less, um, less optimal doors instantiations will instantiate a document as a class and all, uh, all object models or formal modules, I should say, are represented as documents. But actually, if you look at what doors provides you, um, it's very similar to Core and Vitech in that formal modules really are trying to represent object classes. And the link modules is the terminology in doors represents the relationships that tie those classes together. So the best doors models I've seen, uh, co consequently, actually uh, follow a schema very much like the core and the Genesis tools that we've used. At the next level of example, at the schema, we can now define individual classes that all share common attributes together. Uh, for example, here, the most uh, important in the terms of engineering is probably the function class, the component class, and the binding relationship, the performed by. So we can talk about a function being performed by a component or a component performs a function, transitive relationships that tie these object classes together. Um, I really thank Vitech for providing a truly open architecture tool set 
in that it's allowed me to modify their base schemas. I start my all of my work with their base DODAF schema, and I've added some uh, object classes uh, into the modeling and some relationships that you'll see as we go along. Uh, and I just really appreciate that ability to tailor that schema uh, as I see fit. Finally, there's the actual modeling itself, the instantiation of a knowledge model. And here I use one of the favorites that I use in class. It's very common sometimes to make the mistake of naming a function by just looking at the physical object that performs that function and putting the word provide in front. Um, I caution students against this quite often, and this example that I use is a perfect one. A wing's function is to provide lift. It's also to provide drag and pitching moment, um, six degrees of freedom uh, uh, forces and moments, actually. The function of a wing is not to provide wing, right? So it's important that we teach students and, you know, language skills, good writing skills, good communication skills are part of being a good engineer. It's important for us to teach students, look for that proper functional verb. Don't just take the easy way out and stick provide in front of your physical component, because sometimes that will be very confusing, if not a little bit ridiculous. So these are our first three levels, or, or uh, three levels of modeling that we use in uh, model-based system engineering paradigm. Now let's look at the value that each one of these levels gives to us. So the class relationship model being the foundation, it yields the ability to divide, to find different classes of objects, how a function is different from an operational activity. They're both verbs, but one lives in the customer domain and one lives in the design contractor's domain. So they have different uh, attributes associated with them. And we can also derive transitive and even intransitive relationships that tie these objects together. And one of the things that I always point out to students is any model that does not have any relationships, all it has is instantiations of object classes, is very sparse when it comes to knowledge. Knowledge really comes with the concept of a relationship that binds one class of objects to another. In the schema model, the benefit we get here is that we're able to define different categories of these objects and connect them by specific named relationships. And we can even add attributes onto the relationship. So there's a unique attribute associated with how one class element relates to another class element. Really improves the power. Uh, but again, as I say, the schema, the schema meta model is really about teaching a common language. And, and the idea of language uh, is very important to us. Um, especially when we talk about things like object modeling language and system modeling language. Um, certainly, uh, language can be confusing if we use too much of it. If we have too many words to describe the same thing, that can sometimes lead to confusion. So being able to instantiate a schema that has a minimum required uh, set of objects and relationships to be able to clearly communicate our ideas is, uh, is very important. And finally, in the instantiated model, uh, this allows us to en enable hierarchical collections. Actually, the hierarchical relationships are one set of relationships between objects. Uh, but hierarchies of knowledge tend to also be very prevalent in our work. And so in an instantiated model of components, we know that a high-level system is composed of segments, and the segments are composed of subsystems and the subsystems are composed of assemblies all the way down to components, right? That kind of hierarchy uh, relationships allows us to collect up those hierarchical collections within a given modeling class, along with those unique aspects of the relationships that connect these objects. So this is the value proposition, if you will, of the three levels of modeling that we're talking about, knowledge modeling. Now let's shift gears here a little bit and let's remind ourselves of a very important saying, uh, first attributed to Lewis Sullivan, who was a building architect in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. You see his quote here and the quote that stands out is that form ever follows function. We need to consider what function we are trying to achieve before we select the form of the design. 
This is very important to teaching engineers. An engineer is typically uh, fascinated by physical objects. You know, some of us took the phone apart when we were young to see how it worked. Um, but there's a little hazard there. We try to teach our engineers, don't immediately jump to a physical solution. Stop and think about the function before you choose a physical solution. So one of the things that can generate a question about that, well, if, if form follows function, then what does function follow? And we should all understand as systems engineers that it follows the operational need. What does our customer need in terms of their operational capabilities? Once we can identify that and understand that in a rich manner, then we can easily identify what functions we need to incorporate into a system that we will offer to the customer and potentially sell them to achieve their operational needs. This becomes the basis for the modeling schema that I instantiate as I teach this class. You'll see, it's derived actually from DODAF. This is the original view of DODAF was broken down into three domains. The DODAF, the architecture framework was broken down into an Operations domain, oh, where have we heard about that before? How about the last slide? The operations domain is very important to the DOD. They need to be able to complete their operations successfully. So that's what drives the usage cases or use cases or what we used to call CONOPS. Those CONOPS drive the design solution to give me the functions and physical components that I need from a system. So we had the operations domain, the systems domain, and then the technology domain, which is really mostly about invoke standards. We develop standards because it makes our work easier, makes things compatible across different suppliers. And so those standards constrain the design solutions in most cases. But uh, in considering DODAP back in the days when it was formulated, I quickly found that the technology domain is a little bit problematic because it is not orthogonal to these other two domains. You can have technology standards that certainly constrain physics, physical components and functions, but we also have technology standards that constrain operations. The challenge and respond methodology that pilots use in the cockpit, that's an operational standard that is employed so that pilots can fly together even if they've never met each other before. So the technology standard sort of kind of covers over all of the other two uh, domains of DODAF. And that's what we see here. All major DOD acquisitions now require DODAF compliant architecture products. We used to call those documents, but in the new age, we're talking about providing entire integrated knowledge models that can generate documents as well as provide a Google-like capability to customers to help answer their questions about details of the system we provide them. As I mentioned, DODAF is non-orthogonal because of that technology domain. It can really spread across ops and the system domain. However, the good news is there is a similar uh, architecture domain or architecture framework. It's derived from this DODAF concept, so therefore it is compliant. And that is the orthogonal architecture domain that I use as the basis for my class, which we see here. It's a fairly busy slide, but it tells lots of stories. First of all, you'll see in the orange or red words, you see our familiar relationship concept. These are the relationships that bind together our triplex orthogonal architecture uh, framework, if you will. We can talk about how someone uses a system. We talk about that in terms of activities that are performed with the system and how long those activities take in terms of durations. So from that, I derive the concept of an operational architecture. We often call one aspect of an operational architecture our use case models that we build. That's just one aspect of it, right? We have uh, various different techniques we use to build an operational model, but the intent here is to completely decouple the customer's sandbox, if you will, or the customer's concern area from the concern areas of the contractor who's developing solutions. We always want to make sure that we understand this is how the customer operates, and we don't want to confuse it with functions we are providing them or physical components we're providing them. 
So this operational architecture gives us a very rich capability to explore the customer's operating space, to understand their needs within their operating context. Of course, then we look at the functional domain. Both of them are verb-based. One of them talks about the verbs of how you use a system. The other talks about the verbs that a system performs or what a system does. And so this involves transformations from inputs to outputs, very much associated with algorithms in the software world. From this is what we align with the functional architecture model. We're all familiar with functional decomposition. Uh, I often hear people say that functional analysis is not a design activity. Um, I tend to disagree with that because we can talk about good functional decompositions that are loosely coupled or only coupled through how they pass information. We can talk about highly coupled functional architectures, which are very difficult for reuse um, and which often lead to the fix one feature, break three other features problems. So there are good and bad functional architecture decompositions. We usually use coupling and coherency. We seek to minimize coupling, maximize functional coherency. So it is very much a system engineering design activity in deciding how you decompose functions uh, for the life cycle of the program. And then finally, the third and most favorite domain of most engineers is the physical bits, what the system actually is composed of. Uh, the components, the chips, and yes, even software code is actually physical. We may think of it as functional because that's what it does, but code itself, even down to the ones and zeros, is something very physical. It's just implemented into uh, physical devices called chips. Um, sorry that I'm a guidance nav and control person, but if you look at the background there, you see a feed forward loop and you see a feedback loop. That's because we have inputs to our system development uh, activities, initial capability, design descriptions from the customer, customer con ops. They will often give us a weapon system specification. And this is actually the feed forward or the command term in our control system of development. We develop evolving system concepts. We try to develop them across these three domains. And most significantly, you see at the bottom, is requirements underpin everything we do. We can define requirements within our knowledge model and we can link those requirements by the specifies relationship. We can define operational requirements. For example, it's a very good operational requirement for pilots to actually deploy the landing gear before they land the airplane. We could call that an operational requirement. Most line check airmen will fail you if you don't put the gear down before you land the airplane. We can specify re requirements in terms of the need for a given function, as well as what the function inputs and outputs may be, but most importantly, how well the functions have to perform. That's a very rich area for specifying and deriving requirements. And then finally, we can also constrain the physical architecture. We don't like to actually specify what the solution is, but we can constrain how big it is or how much power it consumes or how much it costs. These are the architecture aspects in the physical domain that we may wish to constrain and again, specify. So again, apologies for being a guidance nav and control person. We always think in X, Y, Z. You'll, you'll probably see G and C people always running around with their hands up in this configuration that you see, the right hand rule that we all learn. Uh, the XYZ coordinate system. And what I'm pointing out here is this architecture framework very much follows the right-hand rule, even down to the language of mathematics, if we look at it a little more closely. So I align the operational architecture with the thumb. I align the functional architecture with the index finger. And I align the physical architecture with the middle finger. And if we look at it, if we remind ourselves about vector mathematics that we learned as engineers, we learn about something called the vector cross product. One of the most important things we learn about the vector, vector cross product is that it is not commutative. It is not like typical uh, multiplication and addition. It has to happen in a certain order. And so here we see a pseudo vector equation that I teach to my students that the way to achieve a customer's operational intent is to cross the functional need 
into a physical system design. Um, that's the way that we ensure that we will achieve the customer's operational intent. On the other hand, you could look at a vector cross product where we do the opposite. And what we clearly see here is we end up, if we take a physical device and say, I'm going to try and force it to perform a function for which it was not designed, the chances of me re uh, meeting the customer's operational needs are very low indeed. In fact, they are negative. So we see that the non-commutative aspect of uh, vector cross products is very well aligned with this architecture framework. So we don't want to be selecting physical objects. Here, I have this rock. I just found this rock by the side of the river and I'm gonna make this rock fly. And by gosh, I'm gonna try and make that rock fly and carry a customer's 50,000 pounds of, of stuff, 7,000 nautical miles. Not very likely, right? The most likely chance of success is to first understand the customer's operational need, develop the functions that will meet it, and then and only then design the physical elements that will instantiate those functions. Another way that we can look at these orthogonal dimensions uh, with our reminders here on the side, how a system is used, what a system does, what a system is, is any anytime we break things down into orthogonals, there's always an invariant or an X, Y, Z parameter, if you will, that does not change. Very similarly, that works for us here in the architecture modeling dimensions. In the operational domain, the invariant measure is time and it's reciprocal of frequency. We cannot change time, we are slaves to time. We can only organize our lives and our systems around time as the time ticks by. It's no, it's no accident that mission timelines are central to operational models. What do we perform first? What do we perform next? What activities can we possibly perform in parallel and save time? So that's the invariant measure of the operational dimension. Uh, by the way, it works very well with operational metrics such as uh, mean time between failure or operational avail availability. All of these are keyed towards the time aspect of a system. The invariant measure in the functional domain is motion. Functional flow is what we call it. But without motion from one function to another and without that function performing its transformative capabilities, the system really doesn't function. It stops functioning. So once you lose motion in the functional dimension, you begin to lose functionality quite quickly. So motion is our invariant measure in the functional domain. And then finally, the invariant measure in the physical domain, not a surprise, it's matter. It's networks of components working together, performing functions, ensuring that motion continues, motion of power, motion of energy, motion of information, in order that the operational need can be met. So at this, this point in a, in a class, when I'm teaching students this, I, I often ask them, what, what's the one system that we know about that is the most complex, the most amazingly complex integrated system that we know about. And uh, some of them might say the space shuttle or the you know, International Space Station, but there's always gonna be one student out there that will say the obvious and will say, hey, it's the human body. The human body is an amazing system architecture. We can argue about whether someone actually designed it or whether, about, whether it came about naturally, but what we can't argue about is that the human body actually follows these three orthogonal domains and dimensions that I'm discussing here. Your head, your brain is your operational control center. You think about and you organize your life in terms of time. What am I gonna do first? When I, when I get out of bed, I take a shower and, and then I eat breakfast and then I brush my teeth, right? I build my mission timeline for the day. The functional capabilities are certainly inherent into our center of our body because they depend upon functional flow. The lungs, the heart, the circulatory system, the esophagus, the stomach, all of these are performing critical functions that keep our brain moving, keep our brain operating, keep our body alive, and keep us doing things that we need to do. 
And finally, and not certainly not at the least level, we have this wonderful capability to do 3D printing of human beings. It's provided by our physical means of replication. So the human system can continue to procreate because we can create matter. We can physically, like I say, 3D print new human beings that will carry on our legacy, that will carry on our knowledge into the future. So this is a very useful thing that I bring to the students right at the beginning of my class to let them know you are a walking instantiation of this three-dimensional orthogonal architecture modeling schema that I'm going to teach you over the next 15 weeks. The earlier chart where I introduced the operational functional physical architecture dimensions, I call that my 50,000 foot view, again, with the aircraft analogies. Yeah, shut up, Ray. Can't, sorry, I can't help it. I'm an airplane knucklehead, like I said. These, what I'm showing you now, I call the 10,000 foot view. So we're a little bit closer to Earth. We can see a little bit more of the details. And so what we're looking at is the 10,000 foot view of what are the schema uh, classes and relationships that I use in the operational architecture dimension. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise if you're familiar with DODAF. We talk about operational activity and operational information. We certainly talk about performers, either the people or the objects that perform operational activities. We see the relationships here. Most of these, again, come straight out of the DODAF-based schema from Vitek. But you may notice that I've added some. Um, I've used the risk class that already exists in the DODAF-based schema, and I have instantiated a relationship that risks can be exhibited by operational activities. And a specific type of risk that we talk about in the operational architecture is an operating hazard. We're gonna look at a very specific example of that in terms of an aircraft stall when we come up to our example. Uh, we see operational information can, can be input to and output from operational activities. It can also trigger operational activities to wake up and execute. Um, notice the word modes and states here. There are lots of people who do system engineering by defining modes and states. Modes are nothing more than behaviors how a system behaves. It may behave differently when an airplane is taking off than when it's in cruise mode, right? Uh, so modes are really different types of operational activities that we want to design into a system. You can also almost think about in, uh, defining modes as the first level of operational design before we even select functions, we define how we want the system to behave. Similarly, we talk about states. States really are about, if we think about the concept of a state vector, a state vector has multiple elements in the state vector that describe the state of operation of the system. The aircraft state, pitch roll and yaw attitudes, pitch rate, roll rate, yaw rate, latitude, longitude, and altitude and position. All of these are quantified as states that we use in our control laws to control the aircraft. So modes and states very much aligns with this operational concept. I'm gonna cover up some of these modeling states right now because I wanna focus on two of them. So we call these ones that I'm covering up, we actually call those our operational models. We can string together instantiations of those modeling classes and those relationships to describe how a customer operates in their operating environment and how they may consider operating a new product. Um, so those are our operating models. What I'm highlighting here with these last two classes is it's often difficult for young students to identify where do requ requirements come from and, and how do I derive requirements? Well, it just so happens that these two classes, the metric class and the risk class, they both are rich sources of derived requirements. Let's talk about the metrics class. I've already talked about the risk class. Notice that it's quantified by, that the metric is what quantifies how good any operational activity is executed. Um, you see I use a very specific type of metric when I'm in the operational domain. I call it an MOE. Most of us are familiar with this, a measure of effectiveness. I even sometimes modify that term and call it a measure of operational effectiveness. 
Um, how far can my airplane cruise? How long can it stay in the air? How much payload can it carry? And how far can it carry? Metrics are extremely important to engineers. We need to identify metrics so we can prove that our systems meet the customer's operational intent. Now, not all metrics will result in a requirement. In fact, quite opposite. We tend to measure way more about a system as we develop it and test it than we would ever specify. So there will be, end up being many more metrics than there will be requirements to meet those metrics. But some subset of those metrics, those measures of effectiveness, will certainly do well to quantify our operational activities. So we can prove to the customer we meet their required performance. Same thing in the risk class. We have to worry about what types of risk can be exhibited by performing operations. Anytime you fly an aircraft, I don't care what the design of the aircraft is physically or functionally, it is subject to an operating hazard called stall, the airplane falling out of the sky because you pulled too high of an angle of attack and you stalled the lift production of the wing. That's an operating hazard that is independent of the functional and physical design. So we need to recognize that and identify that as such in our modeling classes. We can then derive requirements that are going to mitigate those risks. For example, a stall warning system is a regulatory requirement that all aircraft have to have to be certified. And that's the example that we'll be looking at in future slides. Very much the same category. This is the 10,000 foot view of the functional architecture. Okay, Functions and items, I, I use the pref prefix data in front of item, but we can also model items as power exchanges. Uh, very much similar to the operational domain. Functions are verbs, just like operational activities are verbs. Uh, some students can get confused about them, but we have some rules that help them sort that out. Data items can be confused with operational information, but actually the data items are the functional instantiations that help meet the needs of the operational information re uh, required in the operating model. And then we add a new modeling class here. Functions can produce resources hydraulic power, electrical power, cooling power, pneumatic power, thrust, or aerodynamic power, we call it. Every function can, or not necessarily every function, but many different functions provide services that we would model as resources. Uh, you'll notice two relationships that go from the resource back to the functions because we can quantify resources in two different categories a consumable resource and a renewable resource. So a resource like jet fuel is something that's consumed and once it's consumed, it has gone away and you can no longer reuse it. But electrical power on board an aircraft can be used as a system powers up and performs its function. And then that electrical power can be returned to the entire collection of electrical power for some other system to use. Once again, I'm gonna cover up some of these because I'm gonna collectively refer to them as those are our functional models that we develop to describe the functional capabilities we need to design to meet our customer's operational need. And once again, we see the metrics and the risk class here, but we see different types associated in the metrics and risk class. In the functional domain, we talk about key performance parameters. These are acronyms that we've all known about and seen. The DOD uses them quite a bit. All I've done here is I have wedded these terms specifically to one architectural dimension. In the functional dimension, we talk about performance and we worry that our functions will meet their performance requirements. Where do those performance requirements come from? They come from defining a metric that quantifies how well that function has to perform. So once again, we see the metrics and the risks, they are very important classes that help us derive requirements for what we need to design. Uh, and again, once again, I'll point out, there are many KPPs that we will define, that we will measure, and that we will even report on in our test reports. They may not rise to the level of a requirement. They rise to the level of we need to make sure that that lower level KPP is correct and appropriate so that a higher level KPP can be met that, 
there is a requirement written against. Same thing with the risk category. In the risk category now in the functional domain, we talk about malfunction. How does a function cease to operate? Or if it doesn't cease to operate, how does it misbehave? This is quite the difference between why an airplane costs so much more than an automobile. Because an automobile, when things are going bad, you can pull it over to the side of the road and avoid any risk. With an airplane, you can't pull over to a cloud. So as engineers, we have to think about malfunctions all throughout the system of the aircraft and how they affect the behaviors of the aircraft and, and indeed how they either contribute to or hinder us from meeting the operational intent. That's the functional class. And then finally, to wrap it up, here's our 10,000 foot view of the physical class. Again, most of these classes come directly from the Vitec DODAF base schema. The component class represents physical components either at the system level, the subsystem, the segment level, the assembly level, all the way down to individual piece parts if you need to model that low. We talk about a generic class called an interface that there are always interfaces that join systems together where they exchange information and power between them. Those interfaces can be comprised of very specific physical links. For example, a hydraulic conduit is a link that connects the hydraulic power generating system to one of its components that uses hydraulic power. A data bus is a typical digital data link that transfers information between components. And those links connect low level components together. Again, we see the metrics in the risk class, which we'll talk about in a second. But let me again show you the extensibility of the schema that Vitec provides us allowed me to add an environment class. The environment class is very important for aerospace engineers because every component we install upon an aircraft has to be qualified to meet the environments that it operates in. Temperature, pressure, vibration, shock, acceleration, right? We can, humidity, salt fog, right? We can name all sorts of different environments. And I just found that it was useful in my aerospace engineering development area to be able to define those environments once and define how I measure those environments, maximum operating temperature versus minimum operating temperature and specify them in an environment model. And then that way, any component that has to live in those environments, I can relate those components to those environments. Makes it very easy for me to write a qualification spec against the component. I just run a script on my database and it extracts the relationship elements and pulls out the environment categories uh, into the test procedure. Once again, I'm going to cover up certain classes and call those my physical models and focus again on the metric and the risk class. Again, we see an acronym that we've used before, KSA, key system attribute. I'm calling this a metric that quantifies physical architectures of components. A good example is in the area of redundancy. Most aerospace systems require more than single string redundancy. If it's a triplex redundant system, then three is a number that quantifies that key system attribute of redundancy. Or a quad redundant system is a KSA value of four to describe redundancy. Okay. We can also talk about other more solid physical metrics. How much a component weighs is certainly important to an aircraft designer how much volume it occupies, how much power it consumes, electrical power as well as cooling power. And certainly customers are worried about how much a component costs. So cost is a very important KSA associated with the physical aspects of a system. And so again, not surprising, the metrics and the risk modes, uh, risk classes are rich sources of derived requirements. And to point at the risk class, what we see here is the end of the waterfall. If you look at the relationships across the risk modeling class, which we'll look at here in a second, we can see that operating hazards can be caused by system malfunctions, and system malfunctions can be caused by specific physical failure modes. We might classify a hazard on board an airplane as a fire, a fire on board. That's certainly an operating hazard, independent of how it happens or what causes it, it's a hazard that we need to deal with. It leads us to have 
uh, smoke detection systems and fire detection systems, as well as fire extinguishing systems. Well, we can think about in the physical domain, we can think about what sort of physical failure mode could cause or could lead to a fire on board, short circuit and a fuel source, right? If those two failure modes, if we have a leak of fuel and we have a short circuit and they, they occur in the same physical zone, then that becomes a failure mode that is ignition and that ignition leads to the operating hazard known as a fire on board. Okay. So we're looking at the risk class here as an area where we can begin to develop our safety analysis as we will see in our upcoming examples. So first I wanna look at, so I've, I've focused quite a bit on the metric and the risk class. And the reason is that because I'm going to give you some examples of how we instantiate architecture models in those two classes. And the first is the metric class. The metric class is really nothing more than the basis by which we develop and perform quantifiable trade studies. Everyone is familiar with trade studies. Oh, by the way, it follows the right-handed rule here, right? We talked about measures of effectiveness or measures of operational effectiveness in the operational domain. We talked about key performance parameters in the functional domain. We talked about key system attributes in the physical domain. A good trade study should be quantifiable. Well, these are quantities that quantify operational activities, functions, and components. So they are basically the source by which we should construct our trade studies if we really truly are interested in quantifiable trade studies. Sometimes we want subjective trade studies or sometimes some customers will demand some element of subjectivity in our trade studies, but we as engineers shall always strive for the numbers. Show me the numbers and show me how they play together. We should always strive for balance across this trade study and across these three metrics. So now let's look at an example in the metrics class. Um, this is an equation we use as aircraft design engineers called the Breguet range equation. The range of an aircraft is a perfect operational measure of effectiveness that the cruise mode can exhibit. The cruise mode of an aircraft exhibits a range that quantifies how far it can fly. Another similar example, we also have a Breguet endurance equation. Endurance is kind of an alternate version of range. It tells me how long I can stay aloft, how long I can continue to fly. Endurance being a measure of time, that certainly is a good association with our operational activity or our operational uh, dimension, if you will. But this is equation, I'm not gonna explain all the aspects of the equation, but what I'm gonna point out is in any given system design, you will often have performance equations like this that will relate an operational measure of effectiveness to functional and physical metrics associated with that measure of effectiveness. In this particular equation, the function fly vehicle is quantified by a metric called cruise airspeed. We choose an airspeed as high as possible, but we also have to worry about how much drag we generate at that airspeed. So there's some optimal V infinity airspeed that we want the airplane to fly at in order to meet its range guarantee. The function generate thrust is quantified by a metric called thrust specific fuel consumption. It's that C sub T variable here. Engine manufacturers, they don't know much about lift and drag, but they do know a lot about thrust. And so we can levy a requirement for a metric on a particular aircraft engine that says, here's how efficient your engine has to be in terms of how much fuel it consumes to produce a certain amount of thrust. Of course, the aircraft manufacturer cares about aerodynamics. In the aerodynamics world, we have a function called generate forces and moments, aerodynamic forces and moments, and it is quantified by the most important measure at the aircraft level is the lift to drag ratio. And finally, we have a fuel system on board that provides fuel services or provides fuel power, if you will. And one way that we can quantify providing fuel service is what our usable fuel load is. In other words, the final weight of the airplane after I have expended all fuel minus the initial weight of the airplane. That tends to define our usable fuel load. 
And actually, that's a backwards equation, isn't it? It should be initial minus final so that I end up with a positive usable fuel load. Uh-oh, we're always finding mistakes in our models and correcting them. You'll notice that some elements of the performance equations are not totally functional performance metrics. There, some of them are KPPs, but some of them are more aligned with KSAs, operating empty weight of the airplane and the initial total weight of the airplane are two measures that really are describing the physical architecture that I have to strive for. I may, it's very often that a uh, system, aircraft system developer will levy a not to exceed operating empty weight on the airplane as a means to make sure that I can meet my final range guarantee. Okay. Weight, uh, uh, weight is certainly one of the most important physical KSAs for an aerospace engineer, I'm trying to minimize it. So here we just see one example of using a performance equation in terms of relatable metrics that cross the three dimensions of our orthogonal uh, architecture schema. What I'm now going to show you is a tool based strictly in Excel. And this tool I use on all my trade studies. It feeds directly off my core databases because core is where I maintain all of my metrics. And I can feed into Excel, this Excel tool that I have built. This is the summary page of a trade, stomach, trade study summary sheet that I use with customers. It gives us a computational uh, spotlight uh, chart that I can discuss with the customers. And it becomes very much a live model that I use with customers in the meeting. What we see here is I've broken down and I'm measuring the abilities of any given design solution. So we show 13 design solutions. Each one of them has its own tab in the Excel spreadsheet. And I show operational scores for each of these design options, functional scores and physical scores. Now, the first thing you may look at is say, hey, I thought you were gonna tell us about a quantifiable trade study. And these words up here, they sure do seem to be subjective. They are subjective, at least at this time. But when I show you an instantiation of one of these design options on the next page, I'm gonna show you that I tie each of this scoring scheme directly to physical metrics that I've defined in my system model. Uh, but this gives a high level picture where I can play what if games with the customer. I can change their priorities in terms of weightings that you'll see on the next page. And then we can come back to the summary sheet and we can see how the colors have changed. Right? Uh, blue means very good physical scores. It generally means the cost is low. Okay? But if the physical score is good, but I don't have any green over here for my operational score, how good is that solution if it can't meet my operational needs? So I've used this on a, on a NASA program back in 2003 called Access 5. It was about uh, NASA was studying how to integrate UAVs into the airspace system. And so we use this on the trade study of the different sensor sets and how we would integrate the different sensor sets. And that's actually the, the example you're going to see on the next slide here. So this is typical of what you would see on any one given page for any one design option. Here I have defined my operational MOEs, my functional KPPs, and my physical KSAs that I'm gonna to use to score for each of the design options. Over here on the right, you can see I've got actual numbers that are associated with the evaluation, the subjective evaluation ranges that I have given score numbers to. And as I mentioned, this is showing an example. We were looking at uh, conflict avoidance in the national airspace. How can a UAV perform conflict avoidance maneuvers? What type of operational metric would quantify how good it is? Well, as we were doing the study, we certainly looked at the most important operational dimension is how far ahead in time can I look at and predict, I'm sorry. How, how far in time can I look at and predict a potential conflict between aircraft. And however many seconds I can look into the future, that's a measure of how good I can operate in the operational dimension. These other ones you can see and understand how trustworthy, what's the guarantee of accuracy. We had an NIC value. I didn't really have good quantification for that, but it's one the customer wanted to see. 
again, that was one of the more subjective elements that the customer just wanted to see in the trade study. But these other ones are clearly objective. Probability of detection of a conflict, probability of false alarm, operational maturity in terms of TRL, availability, how many target tracks can I process at one given time? All of these are measured, whether or not it's susceptible to environments, like can I see through clouds with my system? Is it cooperative or non-cooperative, right? A transponder is a cooperative means of ensuring separation, but a visual system will handle non-cooperative threats. You see the qualitative scoring that I gave each of these, and then you see the weighting factors. This weighting factor is where you can play the what if games with your customer live in your technical interchange meetings. If the customer doesn't agree that conflict look ahead time is the most important for them, maybe probability of detection or probability of false alarm are more important. You change these weights on the fly, it changes the weight that's weighted score automatically, and these are the numbers that get propagated to the summary page for this specific design option. Um, I had rave reviews from NASA when I presented this. They had never seen a trade study that they could actually interact with in the TIM and see what the results were. And all of this was allowed and made possible by the fact that I had separated these metrics in my model. Now let's look at system safety analysis in the same example category. We look across the architecture dimension, the modeling class that we're worried about here for safety is risk, specifically technical risk. Again, it's no surprise that it follows the right-handed rule here. In the operational domain, we talk about operating hazards independent of the functional and physical design solution. In the functional domain, we talk about malfunctions, how a function stops operating or how it misbehaves while it is continuing to operate. And in the physical mode, in the physical domain, we talk about physical failure modes, short circuits, sparks, um, broken wires, right? All sorts of different physical failure modes that can lead to malfunctions. And once again, we're seeking balance here. Our goal is to mitigate operating hazards by min minimizing the impact of malfunctions by being able to detect and isolate failure modes. So all three of these are important and we should treat all three of them uh, with a certain level of balance in terms of deriving our requirements, deriving our safety requirements and our safety artifacts. So now I'm gonna show you for this example safety analysis, I'm gonna show you over here, we've got the risk class in terms of operating hazard, malfunction and failure mode. And I'm going to walk you through instantiated models for the problem of alerting the flight crew when the aircraft is approaching a stall condition. We talked about that stall condition as an operating hazard. Air vehicle stall is something that can happen and I need to worry about it as a designer. Well, part of the malfunction, if I'm going to implement a stall warning system, by the way, which the federal aviation regulations mandate that I have to incorporate a stall warning system, I have to think about the loss of function of that stall warning function. I can also have to think about how it may misbehave. I may not lose the function, but that function may lie to me, and that could also increase the probability of a stall. And of course, I can think about physical failure modes that may cause a malfunction in the stall warning system that could also lead to stall. I selected this particular failure mode because if anyone's keep, been keeping track of the Boeing 737 MAX issue, they've been grounded for a couple of years because a problem with an enhanced stall protection system they incorporated in the 737 MAX. Essentially, the Boeing 737 has a dual redundant AOA system, but the baseline system, which did not include what they call the MCAS, the Maneuvering Control Augmentation System, did not incorporate a means to control the stabilizer on the earlier versions of the 737. When they went to the 737 MAX, they began using sensor value feedback from the angle of attack vanes as a means to actuate the horizontal stabilizer, the most powerful pitch de uh, cr uh, creating device on an airplane. Um, if one AOA vein is bent, I, ideally the two AOA veins, one on each side of the airplane, they should always point at the same AOA. 
But if one AOA vein gets bent, let's say I move some air stairs up to it, I collide with the AOA vein and it gets a little bit bent, then they're going to disagree. When I'm flying, they're both going to report different angles of attack. So I'm looking specifically at this failure mode as causing a malfunction in our stall warning system that could lead to a stall. You see the cause by relationship. This is the, the cascading or the waterfall relationship, if you will. An air vehicle stall can be caused by a loss of function of my stall warning system. That could be caused by a disagreement between my dual redundant AOA veins. Now, thinking about this, the context within which I have to think about all of these risks is my functional design. Over here in my functional design, I've identified that I need a function to alert to when I'm approaching stall in the air vehicle. And I need certain AOA information that's gonna be input to that function. And I'm gonna provide certain flight control system enunciations that are outputs to that function. We look at the specific instantiations here. We see that I need, first of all, I need to know information about the aerodynamic limit for angle of attack, usually in the 12 to 15 degrees range for a conventional airplane. But I need to incorporate that information into my software that is going to perform the stall warning function. How far is too far when it comes to angle of attack? And of course, then I need to measure the angle of attack. Well, that's done by our AOA sensor veins. So these two pieces of information are input to our stall warning function. Obviously, what comes out of the stall warning function is an indication of stall. This is often performed with what we call a stick shaker. We put a little motor on the control column. We activate that motor and it vibrates the control stick. It makes the pilot feel like the, the aircraft is stalling. In a fully mechanical airplane, you will feel the buffet of the stall on the elevator. In a hydraulically controlled airplane, we need to augment that with a stick shaker motor. But this output is essentially saying, hey pilot, you're getting too close to stall and I need to let you know you're getting into a risky area. Not only do I need to put output stall, but I need to output faults. I need to be able to detect faults, failure modes, if you will, associated with my equipment. And I need to be able to assert when the stall warning function has failed. If I have lost my stall warning function, I need a failure indication provided to the pilot saying, please be careful about how you pull angle of attack G's because you don't have a stall warning function to protect you anymore. There's relationships here that we talk about, right? Functional inputs, the items that are needed by this function to perform its task, and what are the outputs of that function. So we look at our risk category. We are, identify that there are functions that are going to be used to mitigate this risk. We now have to fill gaps in here, and those gaps are the source of requirements. First of all, we see here the FAA as I already identified for us, that stall is an operating hazard, and it results in an FAR requirement 25.207, thou shalt incorporate a stall warning function. So we can say it specifies the need for this function to be included in your system design. We can also look about relationships between the idea of identifying a malfunction in the stall warning system that can be exhibited by that function. So loss of function is one type of malfunction that can be exhibited by the alert to AV stall function. We can also derive a requirement for how good does that stall warning function have to be in terms of what is its probability of loss of function. We call that the stall warning alerting reliability metric. And that metric specifies how good this function has to be. What is its probability of loss? Right? The solution, the physical solution to this is having multiple strings of angle of attack redundancy, being able to compare one bent vein against another so that I can say, hey, there's something wrong. One of these two angle of attack uh, sensors is lying to me. And so I need to be able to enunciate that as a fault. Finally, I can even levy requirements on fault detection. The very fact that I have physical failure mode called a bent AOA sensor vein results in a requirement that I specify to detect failures. Or another way of saying that is I need to assess the stall warning enunciation, stall warning alerting subsystems health. That requirement specifies certain aspects that 
first I have to output the ability to indicate a stall, but I also need to know when I've detected faults and failures associated with that function. So clearly we see here how we can use our model, our risk model, by identifying our hazards, malfunctions, and failure modes as a means to plug the gaps in our system requirements that will flow to our functional design. That's pretty much the intent of my presentation, but the last two important pieces I wanted to re relate to you was why do, why do we offer this course and how do I structure it? So we offer the course because when I was an undergrad, I was given all of these technical skills on, on how to do aerodynamics analysis and control system analysis and design control systems. I was given all those tools, but as an undergrad, I was never given a, a, a knowledge framework that I could reason within. And so that's why that was the motivation for me developing this class is I wanted to give students a means to weave all of those technical skills into a relational environment that they can use to reason about the systems they're developing. Call it a tool, if you will, but really it's just the idea of a knowledge model. The more you build about a knowledge model about your system, the more questions you can ask about that system, and then you can begin to answer those questions. To deliver and coach an actual, sufficiently restricted, DODAF compliant, system modeling language. And I ask the question here, we're talking about SysML 2.0 coming up in the future. It, we talk about it as a language, but I, I have a feeling that it's called a language just because it was evolved from UML, which was called a modeling language. But isn't it really a design notation that we've tried to build a language around? And shouldn't we really talk in terms of a language before we even talk about design notations and how we draw diagrams. That's, that's my opinion on this. I may not be right. Some people may say I'm deadly wrong on that. But to me, it's very important that I give my students a technical language that they can reuse over and over again in the context of their development, and then have the model draw the diagrams, the diagram notations, by extracting that knowledge from the model. We also do this to emphasize explicit knowledge capture during de the development. One of the biggest problems we can run against complex system development is the engineer, and they tend to be old people like me, that all say, where is that written down? That knowledge that you just told me a story about, where can I go read that? And they have the answer, it's all in my head. Well, that is clearly a barrier to success. Because by not making the models extant, by not bringing them out of the engineers' heads, there's a real, very, very real possibility that the model in my head is different than the model in your head. And then that will cause the possibility of an integration nightmare when we bring our components together to integrate. Um, furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, drawing notations, they evolved from our need to communicate knowledge and relationships. The drawing notations are not an end in and of themselves. They are conveying knowledge is what they're doing. So knowledge really underpins the concept of a drawing. Most importantly, I try to get across to my new students. One of the aspects of an engineer is that you never ever stop asking questions because by asking questions, that leads to answering those questions Answering those questions leads to betterment of system development designs. But most importantly, I try to teach my students those aha moments when you figure something out, either when you figure out an important question or you figure out the answer to that important question, they don't always come when you're sitting at your desk. I often tell a story that on Fridays, I often go to a friend's house and play some pool, play some billiards and drink a few beers. And there's been more than one time on a Friday afternoon that I've left work and I'm relaxed and I'm shooting pool and I have that aha moment about something in my engineering career. And so I send myself a text message or an email. It's very important to capture that knowledge when it crosses your mind because it could be gone in the midst of a few seconds, especially if you're drinking beer. Okay. Finally, I need to prepare new graduates to be immediately effective within their major. Um, this is something that we strive very hard for at a Polytechnic University. 
um, we get lots of good feedback from the people who hire our students that, my gosh, your, your students were ready to go. They, they knew how, how to do things. I didn't have to tell them how to do things. They were very good at reasoning about things. And so that gives us an ability to demonstrate to potential employers and to the students that requirements are discovered by considering the needs of our, our customers and needs analysis and by exploring the knowledge and technologies associated with what we have available to us today. Also, we need to encourage collaboration. Engineers tend to be very um, siloized people, right? Engineers, not a lot of engineers are good at communication. And so in our environment that we teach in at Cal Poly, a lot of our projects are project, or a lot of our classes, I should say, are project-based because we're trying to develop their effective means of communication. One of my future goals, and some people laugh at me at this, one of my future goals is that someday design reviews will not be in PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a wonderful tool as I'm using here, but it doesn't allow me to explore what I call knowledge threads. Tools like Core, uh, Core and, Vite and uh, Genesis allow me real time to walk a customer through a set of relationships to explain an answer to their question. We've actually done this in my previous life at Northrop Grumman. Um, one of our contract wins, uh, the, the feedback we got from a customer was, those thread walks you did, you walked us from operational through functional design and physical design, you answered questions across those dimensions. Those thread walks were very effective and they were very effective in helping us understand, you guys have your act together, we wanna give you a contract. So this is the kind of goal that I teach to my students is I, someday I want you to be pro providing your design reviews completely in a model-based environment and PowerPoint now becomes the backup to that not the other way around. Finally, my last slide, how do I implement this? My class, Aero 4510, I focus on large scale aerospace projects that are intended to advance humanity. I, I seriously work at large scale because it is an architecture development course. It's not a uh, piece part component. We don't develop electrical circuits in the aerospace curriculum. We develop entire aerospace systems. So using projects, a good example of a project we did last semester, uh, I had a Mars system architecture team and I had individual segment teams that reported to that architecture team. And the goal was to define and develop uh, the requirements and models for a permanent Mars transportation system to, between Mars and Earth and a human habitation capability on Mars to be able to do research on Mars. So those are the types of projects that we really stretch the students uh, to employ this model-based reasoning uh, implementation. The students, of course, will work in teams. They work on their specific systems. We're stressing that requirements come from the models. I just held an SRR yesterday with some students and what they displayed to me was they were very much in the old terms of thinking they showed me their requirements up front and then they showed me the models at the end and i said hey we we got to turn that around you got to show the models first and then you're explaining how the requirements are derived from consideration of the knowledge in the models it's a 15-week semester at cal poly pomona uh, this particular class meets two times a week 75 minutes for each session the way I structure it is my Monday session is strictly MBSE topical lecture, slides that I give them and I also in, uh, bring up core in the classroom and I show them the models that I have used and reused uh, in my own work. And then session two on Wednesday, it's all about interaction, interaction with your teammates, with your uh, instructor, modeling things as a group, questions and answers, right? The more questions you ask, the more answers my model can give. Certain ideas for designs, problems with the designs, questions students may have about how to develop their models. Midterm is essentially nothing more than a system requirements review presentation. We just completed this in week seven. The focus is on the operational model. You're trying to convince your customer, I understand how you need to operate. I understand how you operate today, and I may even understand and have some ideas on how you wish to operate in the future. 
I've identified metrics, measures of effectiveness that quantify your operations. I've identified hazards associated with those operations. I certainly am saluting to your customer requirements, but I'm also showing you how I'm gonna derive requirements and I'm gonna show you how I'm capturing the regulatory requirements as we go forward. The end of the term, we do a preliminary design review. That's their final exam presentation, week 15. The focus here now is on the functional and physical models that act as the solution to the customer's needs. The metrics associated with them, KPPs, KSAs, the resources that we have to track with our simulation models, the safety malfunctions and failure modes that we have to address in our designs, our trade study, how we structure our trade study, and the results of our trade study. Finally, they turn in the entire integrated knowledge model as a separately graded final project. So not only do I grade them on their presentations and the clarity of their presentation, but I also grade their core and genesis models. I have several scripts that I have written in core that actually query the database, and those scripts help me grade their final project in terms of a defined rubric that I give them at the beginning of the semester. This is the grading schema that I use, the rubric. I give four pop quizzes, 10 points a piece throughout the semester. They always are given at the beginning of the class. And that gives me a way to assess each individual, how they are picking up on the concepts I'm teaching them. And then the rest of the elements are, are all graded as a team. The system requirements review, 15 points. PDR, 20 points. The knowledge model, 25 points. And then the importance of teaching leadership is I also instill that the team leader can adjust individual efforts. So not everyone on the team may necessarily get the same points for their team projects if the team leader felt they weren't pulling their uh, weight or they can plus up a certain team member. This team member did exceptionally well and they really did more than carried their weight. So the team leaders have that ability to adjust the, the scores. With that, I want to thank you for listening through to my presentation. That is my email if you need to get a hold of me. My company, Sephirotic Operating Systems, is the banner under which I do both teaching and consulting for customers. And I use the example and the tagline, we are the matrix. And that's a hearkening back to one of my slides where I showed you the human body architecture. We literally are a matrix of operational, functional, physical. And that's the approach that I take in all my design work. Thank you much. And now on with questions. Thank you, Ray. Um, it looks like we've overrun our time, so I appreciate everybody's patience and attention. Um, at this point, uh, if you've asked any questions, we will reach out to you. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, if you have questions for Ray, you can send it to his email. You can see the address on the screen. Um, or you can send it to Vitech. Um, you can go to LinkedIn um, and put uh, the question there and we'll get ready to answer for you. Um, thank you much, so much for coming today. Um, please join us next month, November 12th at 11 a.m. when Brian Selvey will host um, the webinar, Enhanced Failure Modes and Effects Analysis Capabilities in Genesis. Uh, the link to register will be on our website. Remember that at the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. That's all for today. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.